15 minute or less lecture series, Human Anatomy, Chapter 8, the skeletal system, the appendicular skeleton. The appendicular skeleton includes the pectoral girdles and the pelvic girdles, as well as the limbs that are attached to the axial skeleton by these girdles. The pectoral girdle consists of the clavicle, the collarbone, and the scapula, the shorter the shoulder blade. Uh, the clavicle, sort of S-shaped bone, has a sternal end that articulates with the clavicular notch of the sternum, has a colonoid tubercle pointing down uh, posteriorly, and a acromial end that articulates with the acromion of the scapula. The scapula, a large triangular-shaped structure, has a large, smooth subscapular fossa that lies on the thoracic cage. It has a glenoid cavity uh, that on its lateral side that articulates with the head of the humerus. It has, coming off of the glenoid cavity, the coracoid process. And then coming off of uh, the spine, you have the acromion. This process articulates with the clavicle. Flip it over to the posterior view of the scapula. You have the supraspinous fossa, nice smooth area. The spine, this long ridge on the posterior side of the scapula, and the infraspinous fossa. So the spine ends with the acromion. Then you have the humerus that articulates with the scapula. You have the Proximal end that has the lesser tubercle sticking out and, uh, anteriorly, the greater tubercle sticking out laterally, between them the intertubicular sulcus. Uh, you have about halfway down the shaft the deltoid tuberosity. Then going down to the distal end, you have the smooth rounded cochlea on the medial side, the capitulum on the lateral side. Above them is the lateral condyle and the medial condyle. And also above the trochlea is the coronoid fossa, and above the capitulum is the radial fossa. Flip it over to the posterior view. You see the distal end is a large fossa called the olecranon fossa. Also up at the proximal end, this rounded knob is the head of the humerus that articulates with the glenoid cavity of the scapula to form the shoulder joint. You have this little jagged line called the anatomical neck of the humerus, and then down here is the surgical neck. It's imaginary but it's where the uh, humerus often get breaks. Here's the forearm. The forearm, we have the ulna, the medial bone, and the radius, the lateral bone. They are connected by the interosseous membrane. Uh, the ulna has this U-shaped proximal structure called the trochlear notch. Uh, the little lip that sticks out anteriorly is the coronoid process. There's also a, a rounded uh, depression called that's nice and smooth called the radial notch and then down at the distal end this smooth rounded area is the head of the ulna. Flip it over posterior this large portion that sticks out is the olecranon. Go down to the distal end this little point is a styloid process. In the lateral bone the radius. Bloop. The radius the cylindrical portion at the proximal end is the head of the radius. Below that is the neck of the radius. This Large bump sticking out is the radial tuberosity. Go down to the distal end, there's a little depression on the uh, medial side called the ulnar notch. And then a little point sticking down called the styloid process. Here is the elbow. This is formed by the humerus, the radius, and the ulna, where the trochlea of the humerus fits with the trochlear notch of the ulna. And the capitulum of the humerus articulates with the head of the radius. Uh, we'll go down to the carpals. These are the wrist bones. There are eight of them. They are known as the scaphoid, lunate, tricatrium, and pisiform, tra trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. Learn them, live them, love them. Uh, just of those are the bones of the palm of the hand called the metacarpals. They are named one, two, three, four, five using Roman numerals, one starting the same side as the thumb is, and of course right and left. Go next after that is the phalanges. There are a lot of phalanges in our hand. They are also numbered one, two, three, four, five, based on starting with the thumb. However, they are additionally named proximal, middle, and distal. So this is proximal phalanx two, middle phalanx two, distal phalanx two. The thumb, however, does not have a middle phalanx. It only has a proximal and distal one. Uh, from here, we go down to the lower skeleton, the lower portion. The lower limbs are attached by the pelvic girdle to the Sacrum. Pelvic girdle includes the right and left os coxi, that's what we're going to call them, uh, and they are connected to each other by the pubic symphysis, a uh, cartilaginous uh, joint. This does not include the sacrum. Sacrum is not part of the pelvic girdle. However, if you talk about the bony pelvis, 
It includes the sacrum and the coccyx. So these are the bones that help to form the pelvic cavity. There's this brim running around the edge of the oscoxy and the sacrum. Any region of bone tissue above that is the false pelvis, and anything below that is the true pelvis that helps form the pelvic cavity. Uh, this socket found in the oscoxy is called the acetabulum. It helps form the uh, hip joint or the femur. This large hole is called the obturator foramen. Uh, the oscoxy is actually three different bones that help to fuse as we um, become adults. Uh, before they fused, they were known as the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. So we still name those regions of the oscoxy by those names. The superior ilium, the posterior inferior ischium, and the posterior anterior pubis. The ilium has a lot of structures associated with it. The uh, iliac crest running on the top, the smooth depression called the iliac fossa, the anterior superior iliac spine, the anterior inferior iliac spine. Over to the other side, you see this rough patch. That's the auricular surface that articulates with the sacrum. At the very back of that is the su posterior superior iliac spine, the posterior inferior iliac spine, and then the greater sciatic notch. Moving down, we then have the ischium. The ischium includes the ischial spine sticking out and the lesser sciatic notch. Then the arm portion that attacks to the pubis is the ramus. You flip it over so you can see the acetabulum. This rough, thick patch is the ischial tuberosity. Uh, go to the pubis, the anterior inferior portion. Uh, you have the superior ramus articulating with the ilium. You have the inferior ramus articulating with the ischium. You have this point that sticks out called the pubic tubercle. And then this rough area here is where the pubic symphysis uh, cartilage joint is formed. Uh, disorder that can occur in an infant is hip dysplasia, where the head of the femur does not fit into the acetabulum properly. Uh, this uh, either slips out or the ligaments are too loose. This can be corrected if necessary. Here is normal versus displaced. You can also see how the ilium and the ischium are not fused together. All right, the femur helps is, is the thigh bone, as it were, the largest bone of the body. The head of the femur, this big rounded knob, fits into the acetabulum to form the hip joint. This is followed by the neck of the femur. You have a large, rough area sticking out uh, laterally called the greater trochanter. And then there's a very faint line, hard to see, called the intertrochanterical line. Go down to the distal end, there's a smooth area called the patellar surface, articulated with the patella bone. Uh, if you look into the head of the femur, there's a little depression called the fovea capitis. Uh, again, here's the greater trochanter. Oh, look, there's a lesser, lesser trochanter. In the posterior view, you can see the lesser trochanter much easier. There's a bit of bony tissue connecting the greater trochanter to the lesser called the intertrochanteric crest. Uh, this jagged, this pointy line going down the length of the shaft of the femur is called the linea aspera. Go down to the distal end, you got these two rounded, smooth knobs called the condyle, so a lateral condyle and medial condyle. Above them is the lateral epicondyle and the medial epicondyle. And the depression between the two condyles is the intercondylar fossa. Here is the patella, small sesamoid bone, a wide base at the uh, proximal end, a pointy apex at the distal end, flip it over, you've got the articulating surface that articulates with the femur. Then we have the tibia, the large bone of the lower leg, that's the weight-bearing bone, and then the thin fibula that's lateral, they're connected by an interosseous membrane. The tibia at the proximal end has a flat medial condyle and a flat lateral condyle, rather than rounded knobs, they're flat. You also have this bit of bone sticking out anteriorly called the tibial tuberosity that articulates, uh, is an insertion site for the patellar ligament. You have this ja narrow pointed line running along the shaft of the tibia called the anterior crest. And then at the distal end on the medial side is the medial malleolus, which is one of the bumps of the ankle bone. All right, uh, you can also see these two little points at the top of the tibia between the two condyles. Those are the intercondylar eminence. Uh, down at the distal end, there is a little depression called the fibular notch that the fibula passes through. And at the very bottom, uh, if you look there, there's a smooth surface called the articulating surface that articulates the talus of the foot. Here again is just looking at the top of the tibia, intercondylar eminence between the medial and lateral condyles. The fibula, long skinny bone, does not bear weight. It has the head of the 
fibula at the proximal end and a smooth rounded, uh, rough rounded area called the lateral malleolus, the distal end. Here is the foot. You had in the foot, you have seven tarsals that form the ankle bone. You have the talus that articulates with the fibula and tibia. Below that, you have the calcaneus or heel bone. Then you have the navicular and the cuboid bones, and then the first cuneiform, second cuneiform, and third cuneiform, seven tarsal. After that comes the metatarsals, and between the tarsals and metatarsals, you have the two arches of the foot. These arches, the transverse arches and the longitudinal arches, help to support the weight of the body, to provide the ideal distribution of the weight, and also some leverage when we're walking. There are five metatarsals, after the tarsals, they are num named one, two, three, four, five using Roman numerals, one starting with the side where the great toe is or the big toe. And then the phalanges make up the toes. The toe bones are the phalanges. Yes, the same names as the finger bones. They are also uh, numbered one, two, three, four, five. And again, there's proximal, middle, distal. So this is proximal phalanx two, middle phalanx two, distal phalanx two. And again, the big toe or great toe only have a proximal and distal phalanx. 